Whoever put me before lunch, <laughs> oh, hope you ate a big breakfast. And after Cali, come on, come on. Now, we, we are going to be moving quick through these slides, and I hope there's going to be some redundancy, but I think that's because everyone who's speaking here is submitted to the Word of God, so we're all drawing from that. Um, and uh, I hope that I'll be able to get through all these slides, and I hope that they work. This would be the first time I've gone through them in front of you fine folks. <laughs> Um, so I was tasked with, with this topic of why we must reject incrementalism. And uh, I like the title, why we must reject it, not just sort of prefer or be both and and get, get immediate abolition when we can and incrementalism, but why we must reject it. And I think I'm going to be following along the theme of some of the other brothers as well on this. But yes, my name is Russell Hunter. I've been working in abolition for uh, quite some time. Um, currently working with Free the States. We got a booth back there with the real heroes of the movement, James Silverman and Sam Riley and Rachel Berkey. So uh, please come get our pamphlets and um, that sort of thing to go into greater detail on what we're going to talk about. But now we're going to like open the water hose and you guys are just going to get pummeled. All right. So why we must reject incrementalism. I'm going to start out with three admissions. I say admissions. These are things that I'm admitting to. These are really presuppositions. Generally, probably wouldn't have to state them in a group like this, but I'm going to so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I'm not a pastor or a preacher. Um, I'm from the academic world. Uh, went to college for like 11 years. Yeah, history and philosophy. I guess I use some of that today, but as someone who studied and all that kind of stuff, um, let me just tell you where I'm coming from. The foundation of everything that we're talking about, everything that I'm going to be arguing today, it's the Word of God, right? Let's admit this. Let's be bold about this. The Bible reveals the will, character, and commands of God. Everything we think, say, and do as Christians should be governed by the Word of God. As Christians, we are commanded to keep the commandments of Christ, walk in the will of God, by the Spirit of God, and submit everything we do to the Word of God. It's crazy that that has to be stated, but when you're talking especially about the pro-life movement and their views, you have to start out. We are Bible-believing Christians. The Word of God is our authority. This is something that gets lost, though. Third admission. Doing what God says is best. It is the most pragmatic, effective thing that you can do. Doing what God says not to do is the worst. Okay? Period. There are no spaces, there are no fields there are no missions where you can jettison the Word of God and expect to be successful. You cannot separate your being a Christian from your involvement in politics or in legislation. So doing what God says is best fittingly says, well, what does God say? That's where we're going to have to start. A lot of these verses the other men have gone over, but we're going to repeat them because they're so important to the argument that I want to make, which is quite simple. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause, Isaiah 1, 16, 17. This is abolitionism in a nutshell from the prophet, of, prophet Isaiah by the Holy Spirit and recorded and given to us today. That's what God says, and it is very clear, okay? Very clear. Not only is it clear there, it's repeated throughout the Word of God. It's on the lips of all the prophets. Bring justice, correct oppression, establish justice, often for the fatherless, the widow, the foreigner. 
God doesn't even want our worship if we're not establishing justice. Amos 5. And Micah says, he's told you what he wants. Justice and mercy. When Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees in Luke eleven forty two, he'll say, woe to you. You neglect justice and mercy. These are the things that I've told you in my law and in my word through my prophets always to do. Justice, very important as Bradley went over. Now, on top of doing justice, you're not supposed to deny it. It's not just sort of like establish it. You don't deny justice. Again, all over the Word of God, all over the law of God, repeated by the apostles. Don't show partiality or favoritism. Don't do it. Show no partiality. The Word of God is also very clear. That showing, not just refusing to show favoritism or partiality to some good group over another group. Also, the Word of God is very clear. Showing partiality to the wicked is not good, nor is depriving the innocent of justice. You can't show partiality. You can't show it to the wicked. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Again, God doesn't want you perverting justice, denying it, removing it, framing it. Furthermore, Isaiah continues later on. He says, woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people their right, that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless prey. There's always been people who have been willing to write laws or make decrees which have as their end result iniquity and iniquity towards the fatherless. And God says, woe to those. So do not decree iniquity. The Bible's very clear. Acquitting the guilty and condemning the righteous are detestable to the Lord. Acquitting the guilty... Condemning the righteous. So, do not decree iniquity and do not acquit the guilty. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, like murder, deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Decreeing iniquity, protecting the guilty. Again, that goes for, it's, a, it's an abomination, God says, when an individual does it. It's an abomination when a nation or community does it. Wicked rulers who frame injustice by statute, Psalm 9420, cannot be allied with God. So you don't pervert justice, right? You establish justice. You do not show partiality. You do not decree iniquity. And do not acquit the guilty. I would say that the teaching of the Word of God has this to say about our very topic of what do we do about massive grave injustices, evils, such as abortion. This is what the Word of God says. Be Bereans and look into it. Um, Furthermore, Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Another woe. It's repeated by the uh, apostle in Romans 3.8. And, and I'm going to mention Ephesians 5.11 here because it's going to be funny. It's not a funny verse, but have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Right? Establish justice. Don't show partiality. Do not decree iniquity. Do not acquit the guilty. Never call evil good. Never do evil that good may come. Don't have any fellowship with evil, but expose it. This is what the word of God teaches. Okay, second part here, and this is just something that I have to say, because abolitionists get a lot of flack, because even when we're entering the legislative or political realm, we're often told to be less prophetic. You gotta be prophet politics. You gotta you gotta you gotta travel in different lanes. Pit of hell hogwash. 
We are not diplomats, but prophets. Our message is not a compromise, but an ultimatum. A.W. Tozer is a great quote. A great guy. You should read him. But the reason I want to say this is because abolitionists, really 2010 was a kind of reignition of this. I mean, there's always been this sentiment among the people of God. But back in the 18th and 19th century, they came on the scene not just wanting to right wrong, but they came on the scene with the Word of God on their lips. They were, they were preaching and teaching what Isaiah said to his culture. They were applying it to their culture. So when Isaiah said, there's nothing but wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores, they're not bound up, there's no justice, God hates your worship, he doesn't love your solemn assemblies, repent. That was the message that came before them and the message that he brought to both people and rulers and those who wrote statutes alike. And whenever abolitionists arose in the 19th century, there was the same message, repent of the evil of chattel slavery. People always say, leave their repentance at home. Brothers and sisters, we've had 50 years of child sacrifice precisely because we've left repentance out of the equation. So, it is the Word of God. Get some water. Can you guys read that? Yeah. <laughs> it's the Dead Sea Scroll. It's Isaiah 30. Ah, oh, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the protection of Pharaoh turn to your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt to your humiliation. These verses were the verses that William Lloyd Garrison put before slave-owning United States of America, and the verses that we should put before our country today, and in particular, the pro-life movement. They've got a plan, but it's not of God's plan. They approach it with a spirit, but not of His spirit. And as we've seen, in a country where you have 100 million Christians and ultrasound technology, scientific knowledge and understanding, we can't criminalize the bludgeoning, slicing, poisoning, starving, utter abominable destruction of preborn human beings. We can't abolish it with 100 million professing Bible believing Christians. Why? Because our plan has been ungodly. It's added sin to sin, as the previous speakers have shown, and it's led us down a road that we ought to be humiliated for. What have we been doing? We've been trusting in our war horses and our chariots. We've been looking to our Supreme Courts and our legislators and our pro-life presidents, all expecting them to be able to come up with a clever, cunning, crafty way to get rid of child sacrifice without calling for national repentance. So, Scripture does this quite often. Um, compares Egypt and Israel. There's a lot of, all the way through the Word of God, there's a bunch of, let me remind you of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, right? When, when Isaiah is writing many, many years later, he makes this, what, what is he doing? Why is he saying it? Because he wants to compare people who would insanely trust in Egypt versus trust in the living God. So we're going to go back to Egypt. So first part there, a bunch of propositional truths from the Word of God. I think the Word of God is very clear. The whole teaching of Scripture is very clear on what we are to do and the disposition we are to have towards evil. But besides from commands and prophets and proverbs and the law, we have examples. So let's go back there. Let's go back to Egypt. Exodus. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole book of Exodus. It's an awesome book. There's tons of stuff in Exodus 1 through 4. Bradley actually mentioned some of them. But Exodus 1, we've got the people of uh, Israel. They're in bondage. They're enslaved. Um, Pharaoh sees that they're multiplying out of control, so he asks the Hebrew midwives to begin 
performing basically partial birth abortions, killing the children as they come out. Could do a whole lecture on this, but they disobey that tyrannical order. They rescue babies. One of those babies is called by the Lord. We got in Exodus 3, you got the burning bush. Moses is called and sent to Pharaoh because God has heard the groanings of his people. Right? So that's not very detailed. Lots that we could go in there, but let's look more specifically at Exodus 5 through 12. We're going to read the whole thing. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Exodus 5 through 12. You could preach forever. There's so much in there, and I just invite you to read Exodus 5 through 12 through the lens of this conference. Focusing on, for this, the dialogue between Moses, the first abolitionist, and uh, Pharaoh. So, um, you know, we all know the story. God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh, let my people go. So Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh's first response to this righteous prophet asking for change, <laughs> who is your God? Right? That, well, that, was, that turned out to be stupid eventually, but... Moses goes back and says, well, I did what I did, and now the people are being punished. I did what you said, Lord, but now bricks without straw, and the people are grumbling. Now Moses, you know, he's struggling throughout this whole passage, does continue to trust and obey in, in the Lord, goes back to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says, this time, prove you are serious. Right? This is a governing authority saying, prove you're serious. Probably the dumbest thing that any governing authority has ever done. We know how the story goes. Proving the seriousness, we had blood, frogs, gnats, swarms, livestock destruction, boils, hailstorms, locust, darkness. Right? This, this is <laughs> proving the seriousness. I wish I could go through it, but let's look at some of the dialogue that happens. Now, of course, turning the river to blood uh, was impressive, but the, the magicians could, could kind of do a parlor trick to do that. Um, they could maybe do a parlor trick to do the frogs. The gnats, though, look in the passage. The gnats are a little weird. They're like, oh, mm. I, we don't know how he did that. Pretty serious. So Pharaoh starts going, okay, I think they're serious. I think there's something going on here with this Moses. And after swarms of flies um, show up, destroying stuff, beginning to destroy stuff, the first three there are just kind of like weird and inconveniencing and gross, and, but Egypt is surviving somewhat. But after swarms of flies, Pharaoh's like, come, okay, come, come, in, okay. And he, this is what he says. He says, Moses, you can go sacrifice within the land. All right? Moses has made this demand to go to the promised land, as God has asked him to do. And Pharaoh says, you can go, but within the land. Moses says, no deal. We can't do it within the land. It'll offend you people and your gods. And so He says some weird stuff there, but he says, no deal. And uh, Pharaoh's like, fine, get out of my sight. Later on, after the destruction of livestock, after boils are all over everybody, and hailstorms are destroying pretty much all of the uh, plant stores and material out there, once again, Pharaoh calls back in Moses and Aaron and says, I've sinned. I will let you go. Psych. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? He's like, look at it. He's like, he's like you guys can go. That, that, Pharaoh is so scared and so impressed with, the, with what God's doing. He's like, you can go. Moses goes back out of town, raises his hand, hell storms go away. And, you know, sometimes it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Sometimes God hardens his heart for the purpose of showing his glory. But Pharaoh does not let him go. Then the interesting thing happens after the locusts. So locusts have come through and they've eaten up everything that the hell hasn't destroyed. He says, you can go, but... And he asked Moses, you know, the, the governing authority with this, with this uh, figure says, you can go, but 
who all are you talking about? Like, who all? Like, are, surely not all of you. Moses' response says, all of us, old and young, and our animals too. We're all going. Do you not understand? This ticks Pharaoh off, and he says, Lord be with you if I ever let your little ones go. You can go with the men. You can go with the women, but you can't, you can't take your children. Why does Pharaoh offer him this increment? Because Pharaoh knows that they are not leaving if the little ones are left behind, right? It's a trick, but he's offering it, and it's pretty good increment. You could just take the men. That's what you're really asking, the governing authority says. That's, you know, I know what you're really asking. You came to me with this thing, but I know what you're really asking. Nope. And we have darkness. Okay. And so it's been three days dark. It's like, it's, I don't even know how it worked. It was like dark in Egypt, but light in Goshen. Okay, okay, go. You and your little ones, just not your flocks and your herds. Not a hoof will remain in Egypt, period. Okay? <laughs> now, we've had all these plagues. Like, if you look at Moses at the beginning of the story... He doesn't seem as confident as he is at the end. But he's faithfully trusted and obeyed with the message that God has given him. And by this time, Pharaoh says, you can go. You just got to leave your livestock. Partially because all, their life, all of Egypt's livestock's dead. But you can't go off and stay off without livestock, both to sacrifice to the Lord and to, to feed your, your families. Not a hoof will remain in Egypt, is Moses' reply to that incremental offer. I will give you every single thing, every person that you're demanding. Just leave your animals, not a hoof. Takes him off. Get out of my face if I ever see you again. And so Moses goes out, and of course we know what happens. You know, the Passover and the destruction of all of the firstborn who did not have the blood of the lamb. We know what that's also about, but that's what happened in history. So in Exodus 5, 12, we, we, this is before the law. This is before the law is given. This is before clear commands. I mean, there have been commands to, to Noah and so on earlier. People know murder is wrong, but this is before the law of God. But let me just do three observations. I think at one point in time when I was putting this together, I had 17. <laughs> but I knew they put me after Cali, so. Three observations. One is Moses' Moses's obedience and faith. Secondly, Pharaoh's incremental temptation. Temptations. And thirdly, God's action in response to these things. Okay, four observations. The insanity of trusting in Egypt over trusting in God. That's what's coming through here. So, we've got the commands of God. We've got the example of Moses and Pharaoh. You know what? Most every time that I... I've been telling that story for 10 years. Most every time I pitch that to a pro-lifer, you know what I hear? But we're not Moses. I know, you're Pharaoh. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Like, shouldn't we want to be like Moses? We're not Moses. God's not going to show up for us. God is not going to show up for us if we make a plan that's not according to His Spirit or His will or His Word. He won't. Why would He? Why would we make a plan... That's in accordance with the spirit of Egypt instead of the word. Would God use that to do good so that we learn that we should try to fix everything with iniquitous decrees? We're not Moses. That's absolutely true. We're not Moses. The pro life movement has not been Moses. The Church of the Living God in the United States of America has not been Moses, and they should be. This is why we've been in the shadow of Egypt for so long, to our humiliation. All right, so let's go back. So the Word of God says, establish justice. Do not show partiality. Do not decree iniquity. And do not acquit the guilty. Very clear. We've seen it out. So let's 
That's what God says, okay? Now, I'm going to preface this. Wait, no, this is no quarter of November. No preface, but be okay with me. That's what God says. Now, this is what man says. Panel G3, 2016 or 17. Please play. The pro-lifer who supports incremental legislation is not deciding which children die and which children live. The federal courts have already decided in Roe versus Wade, the Casey decision, and others that no unborn children have a right to life. The courts have already dictated that from on high as the default position. So when people say to me, do you want the federal government involved in the abortion issue, my first response is, do you include the courts in that? Because the federal courts are very involved in this. So therefore, the pro-life legislator who approaches a bill, let's take one for example, that doesn't outlaw abortion in cases of rape and incest, but protects all other children. He is not the one deciding which children die and which one live. He is limiting the evil done insofar as possible given the realities he's forced to deal with politically. And I think that lines up biblically with Ephesians 5, exposing evil deeds rather than leaving them covered. I believe it lines up with the whole teaching of Scripture that we ought to promote good insofar as we can. And I don't think then that the pro-life Christian legislator who would support an incremental bill, if he is indeed or she committed to protection for all children is compromising if he or she supports a bill that limits the evil done and promotes the good in so far as possible. I almost wish that I could just sort of like say, all the scriptures that we talked about, what the whole teaching of scripture says, keep it in mind, listen to that, and you just go, that is wretched awful. But that's what man says. And that's not what man says in the secular world or in the secular pro-life movement. The religiously approved, biblical, orthodox, pro-life establishment. From the stage of G3, which is good, good place, good conference, better now than then on this issue, with the approval of leading figures who are Orthodox members of our tribe. Now, to unpack it a little bit, what man says is limit the evil done insofar as possible given the realities you are forced to deal with politically. Whew. I believe that lines up with the whole teaching of Scripture that we ought to promote good in so far as we can. I will give this brother a gajillion dollars if he can find a prophet in the Word of God who says, I want you to promote good in so far as you're allowed or able. Not the disposition that we are to take. Not the teaching of Scripture. And uh, let's be frank. Um, well, he should have been rebuked the moment he said that. Won't go into it. So, the logic and the argument, and by the way, that was 2016 or 17. Um, he's doubled down and repeated this through Desiring God, uh, Life News, Life Site News. Um, What's the other one? Gospel Coalition. Every time that there's an abolition bill put forward, someone says, Scott, and he, and he repeats these exact same arguments. The argument is that seeking and supporting increments is justifiable if he is committed to the protection of all life and will come back asking for more later. So it's okay to get an increment so long as you come back. So it would be okay to, to go with the men and then come back and say, can we get the women now? To go with the men and the women, can we get the little ones? Go with them, can we get the, you know? That, that sort of thing is what scripture teaches. It's okay so long or only if you're also committed to the eventual goal of uh, total abolition in this case. 
Uh, again, I'm pointing this out, this is 2017, okay? This predates the invention of smash mouth incrementalism. It's smash mouth incrementalism. It's what the pro-life movement has always said and taught. We can get increments as long as we're committed to the eventual goal. So this is what man says. This is what incrementalism is. And seeking and supporting these increments is necessary because, he says, the courts have already ruled from on high. I'm so happy that there's a... Oh. Like, it should make your hair stand up. I mean, well, we'll get to it, but I would have turned over a table. That's why I wasn't allowed inside. <laughs> Side note. Okay, the courts have already ruled from on high, right? The governing authorities, the people in control, the ones who have power, who don't even think we're serious. Egypt sets the parameters, and we simply try to get the best deal that we can get. Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court. It's not exactly a pyramid, but the devil likes that point. I like to turn it upside down. It's on some of y'all's shirts. And yes, that is a golden calf in the middle between the two pillars, and that is the pro-lifers and the pro-choicers both bowing down to the same idol, asking for his permission to protect pre-born human beings from slaughter. So that's what man says. On the turning tables thing, I, I do want to point this out because there was a lot of nodding and agreement, and uh, one of the panelists uh, actually said that after Scott said this, actually said, it's hard to even talk on these subjects because Scott is the authority. He is the expert. I don't even feel like weighing in. He's the expert. And the thousands of people at G3 are just hearing it and then being told he's an expert. Listen to him. Do you want to point out, though, there was this guy. I was hoping this guy would Paul Washer him. <laughs> and he kind of did. <laughs> if you watch the video, a little face, you know? <laughs> but again, we've not been prophetic on this. And we've let what man say, what man says, uh, rule in our churches. I, I don't have the slides here because we're having some problems, but uh, recently, Gospel of Life rally. Lots of great speakers, lots of great gospel proclamations, and right there in the middle of it, limit the evil insofar as you're able. Scott Klusendorf. Still approved. No quarter of November. All right, so Scott is the authority. He's said this in many, multiple places. It is the opposing view, and he is the main defender of incrementalism. But as of late, incrementalism has... Well, actually, not as of late. Let me just tell you. Incrementalism is not just some... Scott, I think Scott's a uh, five-point Calvinist. I think he's a, I think he's a Reformed brother. Um, but... He holds this view. So also, this is uh, Charmaine Yost of uh, Americans United for Life. She holds this view as well. She says it's the entire point of their organization, American United for Life, to incrementally chip away at abortion until eventual total abolition, if it's possible. They always qualify. Ramesh Ponaru, Catholic National Review, Bloomberg analyst, says the same thing. We want to abolish abortion, but we want to do it gradually and incrementally, and, and these people all write defenses of incrementalism, some of them arguing that it's biblical, some of them arguing that it's just prudent and best. And of course, this view of incrementalism is the view of the pro-life generation. It is the reason that we have abortion on demand in the face of so many believers. It's the view. It has to be destroyed. I, don't, I shouldn't make jokes when giving talks about it, because it is why children are being slaughtered. But recently, incrementalism has gotten new life and a new kind of leading defender. I like this guy quite a bit. 
or a lot of the things that he says and does, and <laughs> even how he does them. Um, but he has come along and said, well, let's do smash mouth incrementalism. Maybe we can make incrementalism acceptable. Not biblical, but acceptable. So he says, The heartbeat bill does not yet cover. It's failing in his duty to protect the children still awaiting protection, the ones that the heartbeat bill does not yet cover. I would sign such a bill and include alongside it a signing statement that we will not rest until we protect all the children. That is what I'm calling smash mouth incrementalism. If you give us what we are demanding now, we will most certainly be back in the next legislative session demanding more. So smash mouth incrementalism. If you give us what we want now, we'll come back and demand more. Somehow this sanctifies it, apparently. I would say that that's not new, okay? Smash mouth incrementalism is not different from incrementalism any way, shape, or form. Anyone who tells you that, they're just scared to tell you the truth. It's, it's that, you can find that quote on the lips, lips of secular pro-lifers, Catholic pro-lifers, pro-lifers of all sizes, stri stripes, denominations, all the way back to 1968. We just want to get what we can get. So that's why you've got the things like Callie talked about. You can abort a baby if they are conceived in rape. This is exactly the example that Scott gave in that 2017 G3 panel. You can abort a baby if they are conceived in rape, as long as you come back and save that baby later. Well, let me remind you of the Word of God. You can't support a piece of legislation that makes the fatherless pray. You just can't do it because you're a Christian. And it's not biblical. God, over and over, defend and establish justice for the fatherless. There is no one more fatherless than the child conceived in rape who's being sold out in the culture of death, by not only the parents, his father most of all, then the mother, then the culture, the abortionist, and the pro-life establishment. You can't support it as long as it saves some lives because you can't practice child sacrifice in the battle against child sacrifice. Shame on you. Woe to you. You should be humiliated. That's why I don't get invited back. Okay, Christian legislators can support this filth as long as they are committed to seeking justice for the rape conceived at some future point. Now, Callie was right to mention that uh, they're, they're including that less and less because of uh, the growth and spread of arguments against it. Um, what they did at, after that, you can abort a baby if they can't feel pain. You can abort a baby if you can't detect their heartbeat. You can abort a baby if you look at their ultrasound first. Now, some people got protected because my computer crashed and I lost a lot of slides. But I can bring up Facebook statuses from people you like supporting ultrasound legislation. Precisely because it does a little good. This is a never-ending stream of increments which keeps abortion legal. Right? It's taking all of the temptations, the delays. Saying that you're going to come back for more does not change what you're doing. Woe to you who decree iniquitous decrees. These decrees show partiality towards those with beating hearts, those who feel pain over those who don't, those who are conceived in love and those who are conceived in rape. Shows partiality, makes the fatherless pray. Now, I've always said a never-ending stream of increments, but I think I need to modify it because they're all basically saying, no, 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 it's not never-ending. Abolitionists, shut up. It's just long. It's a long stream of increments. Um, and they've, they've started saying that uh, we just have to state. Like, if you remember what Doug Wilson says, it's okay to do this as long as you, like, if the governor can sign a bill saying it's okay for abortion to be legal up to six to eight weeks, so as long as he signs a statement saying that he wants more than that. 
diplomacy, I guess, but not prophetic. Not prophetic. So, Christian legislators can support all of these bills if the bill does not explicitly state which human beings can be murdered. If you frame injustice by statute, which does make the fatherless pray, you can, you can do this. God will not be allied with you, and you will not abolish abortion. But you can do it. And... Legislators can support all this as long as they're committed to the ultimate goal. They make a statement or sign some sort of document saying that they want more. Then it's smash mouth incrementalism. If I sound just a tad bit angry, it's because I'm holding a whole lot back. Increments for 50 years. You guys know Zeno's paradox? Wow. Well, I went to school for 12 years, I guess you did. <laughs> you can break up something into infinitesimally small increments. You can always do it. You can always, oh, I'm gonna come back for more, but not all. You can always do that. You can do it for 50 more years, and that's what we have been doing. This is, as Denny Burke of the Southern Baptist Convention says, incrementalism. It's the mainstream pro-life position. He says this in an article where he's siding with Doug Wilson and Scott Klusendorf against the Southern Baptist resolution to abolish abortion. Um, it's just doing as much good along the way to total abolition. I love it that they're all having to drop the A word now. Um, and we have to support these policies and like the new Texas heartbeat law, which is where I need to conclude. Um, but, just so you know, I, hey, Callie, where are you at? I love you. But I don't believe there's a secular pro-life movement. I believe there's a secularly minded, religious pro-life movement. And this statement is signed by all these brothers, Denny Burke, Alan Branch, Andrew Walker, Steve Lemke, Daniel Hembach, C. Ben Mitchell, Jeffrey Riley, Richard Land. These are the who's who of the Baptist ethic professors, teachers, and leaders, preachers, all saying this is what they want. And mind you, they are only saying this because of the advance of abolition. This is in response to abolitionism. They wouldn't even say this. Here's the big problem, and this is, uh, you know, I credit uh, my brother Sam Riley here, because sometimes I get all, like, complex in some kind of debate. He's always like, that's not even the definition of incrementalism, that it takes a long time, or that you want to do stuff that's good for a long time along the way. That's not what incrementalism is. That's, they're shifting it. They're sidestepping it. Look at the actual definition. It is what they actually do. A policy or advocacy of a policy of political or social change by degrees. Advocation of change by degrees. The opposite of incrementalism is immediatism. A policy or practice of gaining a desired end by immediate action. By total action. These things have been at war with each other since Pharaoh and Moses. And when you put them up against each other as policies or strategies or ideologies, it doesn't matter how long they take. It's a straw man. Oh, you're saying it has to be done overnight. That's a straw man. Oh, you're saying it has to be done everywhere instead of one place. That's a straw man. What do you advocate? Do you advocate for a degree of change or for the totality? I've done entire lectures with, you know, a tree. You, you know, you've seen these, this tree thing. I draw it over and over and over again, make my colleagues mad. They're like, why aren't you done with the other work? I'm drawing, a, I'm drawing the 17th tree. It needs to be more gnarly. But you know, you know, immediatism and incrementalism, you want to understand it. You, you just imagine abortion as a tree, okay? I'm not going to do the whole thing. We've got, to, we've got to eat. Look at abortion as a tree. The incrementalist looks at the tree, say the tree's a problem tree, you've got to get rid of it, and says, hmm, and he looks at the shears and the axe, and he says, well, how are we going to get rid of this tree? There's all these different, an incrementalist says, well, there's all these different kinds of abortions. There's chemical abortions. There's surgical abortions. There's different kinds of chemical abortions. There's different kinds of surgical abortions. The abolition, so he says, let's get, let's get after those branches. That's our policy. 
branch after branch after branch and after branch, and we're, we're doing it because we're committed to chopping down the tree. Smash mouth. The abolitionist says, you should just chop down the tree because all of those different kinds of abortion are just murder. Please move. This is where it always gets hung up. Apparently, I put too much ink on the paper. Say, focus on the surgical abortions. Well, that keeps the tree growing. That just says advanced chemical abortions. Do it quicker. Detect them quicker. So the abolitionist looks at it differently, and of course, you guys probably have seen my other talk where it's like it's all murder. Now, so legislatively, the incrementalist and the immediatist have two different policies. It doesn't matter how long they take, two different demands. One is a demand of total repentance, abolition, chopping down of the tree. The other is a piecemeal, by degree thing. What gets lost, and it even gets lost in my own talks sometimes, is our legislation also has the effect on culture. So when the young woman in a culture where this tree is thriving finds out she's pregnant, she doesn't have to be young, she could be any age, finds out she's pregnant, she looks at the pregnancy and her situation and thinks, go get an abortion. Even if she hears fetal pain, get an abortion before 20 weeks, she buys that. Heartbeat, get an abortion before six to eight weeks. She buys that. She's being taught and tutored by these laws to continue to do what she is allowed to do by the governing authorities. Now, I had made a big animated version of this, but it just won't play. So let me just walk you through this. Can you all see this all right? They talk about her as the uh, second victim of abortion, and um, the father's usually left out. But what we've got in our culture is one in four people are engaged in the practice of child sacrifice. They're not victims. They're victimizers who are dead in their sin. And they are bound up in this thing. They are strangled in the sin of it. Okay? And we're just supposed to not be prophets, and we're supposed to put forward this legislation. And all of our legislation is doing nothing to tutor them or tell them what they ought to do or how they ought to live. They just see us practicing cunning. They see us saying, if you get an abortion, do it this way, at this place, this state or that state, all this curtailment. And so what do the hearts of the children of men do whenever the punishment against wickedness is not dealt speedily? They do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11, one of the most important verses here. So incrementalism, outside of not abolishing abortion, not achieving what it needs to do, has actually been constantly tutoring our culture and telling them how to kill their children. What ways are permissible at the moment as we gradually get to the end? So, in conclusion, something I agree with Scott and Doug and all those other pro-lifers, I agree with them on this, approaching a bill. When we approach a bill, Scott says, when you approach a bill, the pro-lifer is not guilty if it has a rape exception or an age exception. And the church nods its head and goes along with it. Sounds good. But abolitionist, why we must reject incrementalism? How do we approach a bill? The bill is put before us. The language is posted online, and we can read it. Does the bill establish justice? Does the bill show partiality? Does it decree iniquity? Does it acquit the guilty? Three admissions. If it acquits the guilty, God detests it. Like, hates it. If it decrees iniquity, woe to the people who write it. If it shows partiality, I will not 
be allied with you or your culture. If it doesn't establish justice, I don't even want you to pray or worship me. You read that bill as someone who loves the law of God, who loves the word of God. You reject it because God wouldn't support it. I went to school for art. Why is this so easy for me to understand and so difficult for pastors who've written over a hundred books? You don't assess a bill by whether it purports to save some babies or whether you can go back and save the babies that it doesn't support at the time. Does it establish justice? Rape conceived, pretty easy to do. You can abort a baby if you do it before they possess a detectable beating heart. SBA, big popular thing. I don't even buy it saving any lives, but there's disagreement there. I just think they're killing them all in the pro-life state of Oklahoma, or killing them quicker, or killing them in secret. But the pro-choices are making a killing, raising money off of pretending that it's doing something. But the Supreme Court, our God, will soon do something with it. But right now, let's do SB8. Let's look at the bill. Does it do these things? One, before performing an abortion, an abortionist is required to perform a test attempting to detect a heartbeat. As, uh, you know, John had said the night before, I think Bradley and Callie both mentioned, the abortionist is supposed to be performing the test. Um, hmm, okay, so who's sitting in judgment here? The abortionist is required to write down, because <laughs> they're honest people, in the medical record whether they've... Uh, you know, done this, provide audio or visual evidence. If they proceed to do an abortion, they're going to be fined $10,000. That is the price of a preborn image bearer being knit together in the womb of the living, uh, of the mother by the living God, $10,000. And furthermore, it does not make abortion a crime. It specifically states that the government cannot prosecute an abortionist. It says that only private citizens can bring civil lawsuits against them. It acquits the guilty. And fifthly, it acquits the guilty. The most guilty. Abortionists do not go out in the culture looking for babies to kill. Parents bring the babies to them. Just like ancient faithless Israelites placed their living babies, which they could see, it wasn't like, oh, show me an ultrasound first, on the hands of a burning altar. The people who hire the abortionist are given immunity, may not be prosecuted. It's a license to kill. If you support Senate Bill 8, you support iniquity, partiality, an abomination which God hates. And you can't support it because it does some good. It doesn't. It doesn't establish justice. It shows partiality. It's an iniquitous decree. And it acquits the guilty. So why should we reject incrementalism? Three simple reasons in conclusion. One, the Bible doesn't allow us to. We should reject incrementalism because God rejects incrementalism. We're Christians. Secondly, we're Christians. We're commanded to reject incrementalism. I don't care what you call it. They called it gradualism whenever Garrison and Wilberforce were fighting evils. I don't care what you call it. You, you can't call it something. You can't add smash mouth to it. You can't do any tricks. You can't support iniquitous decrees that show partiality, make the justice pray, and acquit the guilty as a Christian. Now, I'm not saying these people lose their salvation when they do it or they don't have their salvation. I'm just saying they are not possessing a Christian mind or biblical worldview on this. And they need to, I'm sorry, from a big pulpit, repent. I don't care if it's hard on their pride. They need to repent. They need to repent publicly, loudly, so that other people can hear and other people will stop texting me and telling me that the reason they've been incrementalist for five years is because one of these preachers told them that I was imbalanced or insane or out of order or anything like that. 
I love the law of God. You can't embrace incrementalism and love the law of God. And thirdly, because doing what God says is best, you should reject incrementalism if you want to abolish abortion. Thank you. Amen.